Hi, I'm Randy Patterson, author of The Assertiveness Workbook, How to Be Miserable, and How to Be Miserable in Your 20s, and developer of a variety of courses on psychological topics at psychologysalon.teachable.com. If you like this kind of thing, click subscribe below. Over the past several years, I've recommended the animated movie Inside Out to a variety of mental health professionals and even to some of my clients. When I saw it, I was very impressed with the way that the movie took psychological concepts and portrayed them in a visual format that's clearly understandable and for the most part, psychologically valid. The whole time I was watching it, I was thinking, who wrote this thing? Because they had done such an elegant job of creating the psychological world of Riley, the young girl inside whose head most of the action takes place. So now there's a second film, and I found myself thinking, uh-oh, the first one was such a lovely, perfect package and that fit together beautifully. How do you go back to that world and graft on some new story without completely imbalancing the thing or trivializing that first elegant effort? If I was given that job, I don't know what I would have done. So how'd they do? Well, first, I cannot talk about this without revealing aspects of the story. So consider this your spoiler alert. I'm going to assume that you've already seen this film and you're here to see how a psychologist reacts to it. If you haven't seen it, please turn this off. Come back when you have. So, the movie shows Riley a few years on, now contemplating high school and playing ice hockey. Inside, there's the now familiar five basic emotions from last time. Joy, anger, fear, disgust, and sadness. Now, I always thought that those five were a bit arbitrary, but the first movie made a great point that our early emotions tend to be powerful and somewhat pure. We are angry or fearful or happy or whatever. And one of the big plot developments was a developmental shift toward complex emotions that blend these basic feelings, which was really interesting that a movie for kids managed to make emotional development into a major climax that we actually understand. Compare that to the adolescent fantasy aspects of other Hollywood fare, like Star Wars, where the climax is the boy hero finally getting to shoot his missile into the exhaust port of the Death Star. I mean, psychologically, what could that be? Anyway, so early on in the new movie, we get a new idea. Riley has a bad experience, and Joy stuffs it into a kind of garbage tube to expel it from consciousness. Yep, we're just not going to think about that anymore. In 30 seconds of entertaining film, they manage to describe the idea of psychological defense, particularly repression. It doesn't fit with how we want to think about ourselves or the world, so we're just going to pretend it didn't happen. Out to the trash heap you go. Beautiful. Now, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, and I loved the centrality of emotions in influencing behavior, because that's what the emotions are for. They're a kind of behavioral guidance system that evolved in an environment completely unlike the one we now live in. So they often push us to do things that might have been a good idea a million years ago, but now, not so much. They have wisdom, but you cannot hand them complete control or things go bad. We'll run away from stuff that's perfectly safe or we'll hit people when we get mad, whatever. But cognitive therapists look a lot at thoughts that influence us as well. Where are they? Well, the new movie has a glowing tree-like structure that represents Riley's self-image. Thoughts like, 
I'm a good person. Pretty basic stuff. And these thoughts are anchored by memories and experiences that Riley has had. There's a kind of pool underground, beneath consciousness, get it, where those memories sit and filaments grow from these into the tree of the self-concept. And a really nice touch is that these filaments are like guitar strings. When you pluck them, the thought gets expressed out loud. I'm good at things. People like me. I can learn stuff. Beautiful. This gets at the idea that circumstances can pluck our strings and activate certain kinds of thoughts or associations. Now, if we wanted to be a little bit more complicated, we might also have trees that represent our views of other people, the world, and the future. But let's not quibble. So at this point, we're still thinking, the tree is nice, but is it a story? And suddenly, all hell breaks loose, and we're introduced to four new emotions that appear because Riley is entering puberty. Anxiety, envy, embarrassment, and my favorite, ennui, who is an extremely languid character with a French accent. Huh? And these new emotions threaten to take over from the original five. The outside world poses a fairly standard adolescent situation involving the opportunity for Riley to get in with a cooler crowd than her existing friends, and the pull between loyalty and status. Frankly, if it was all about that external conflict, none of us would care. But it's probably smart that the filmmakers didn't make it too interesting. It's something that most viewers can see themselves in, which is the whole point. The interesting stuff is what's going on inside, which is where the filmmakers want us to focus. The new emotions get in the way of the disposal of unpleasant memories. And anxiety sees those memories as really useful tools to motivate Riley to succeed. You know, if we can make her anxious enough about failing, and if she doesn't see herself as being as worthy as other people, she'll work really hard and she'll do better. So Riley's unpleasant experiences and failures begin to get stored in the underground pool and form a new self-concept, one where her worth depends on whether she's a brilliant hockey player and popular to make up for a central sense of faultiness. So now she has two self-concepts. In effect, one that we might think of as her core self, and then this driving, anxious one compensating for her essential worthlessness. This is exactly what the famed originator of cognitive therapy, Aaron Beck, talked about. This dual self-image where one or the other can be urged into dominance depending on the circumstance. You, for example, probably have some situations where you feel comfortable, you feel worthy, you feel competent, and you sense that you're on pretty solid ground and are, generally speaking, good enough. But there are also other situations where you seem to flip and you're an idiot who really doesn't belong and who other people would laugh at as they saw through you, which they can. Maybe it's sports that activate that person. Maybe it's having to do mechanical stuff. Maybe it's public speaking. Could be any of a bunch of things. So Riley's anxious self-image becomes dominant and her old self-image gets tossed onto the trash heap where Joy has been throwing all the bad memories. Much of the story involves a journey back into the recesses of Riley's mind to recapture the old self-image. At one point, Riley even has a fairly realistic panic attack that a lot of adult viewers will find jarringly familiar. Now, you might wonder, is there any particular moment in this movie that people might miss that makes psychologists sit up and take notice? 
And there is. And when you go back and rewatch the movie, I suggest you look for it. It's about one second of film. Blink and you miss it. During Riley's panic attack, as she's beginning to come out of it, there is a very quick shot of her hand touching the rough texture of the bench that she's sitting on. Every shrink in the place is going to go, that's a grounding procedure. It's mindfulness of physical sensation. It is a way to take yourself out of your spinning head and back into the sensory world, the here and now. Now, there was one thing I wondered how they'd handle, given that this is all set into motion, supposedly, by Riley entering puberty, and that's sex. This is a Disney movie, after all, and a lot of little kids are going to be seeing it. What do you do? Well, there's a lot of rich material, even without sex, so you don't have to make it a central part of the whole thing. And what they've settled on is a hot-looking male video game character that Riley quite likes. But let's face it, it doesn't go much of anywhere, and that's probably fine. It would be interesting to see a PG-17 Inside Out 3 to see what they'd do with it. Anyway, this whole thing looks like it's headed for traditional Hollywood movie territory. There's the good guys and the bad guys, and the good guys are going to win, and the whole point of the appearance of these new emotions is going to be lost. It almost took me out of the movie a bit, thinking, how are they going to screw this up? And interestingly, they come up with a resolution that's very similar to the last film without feeling like a letdown repeat. It's an expansion of the complexity of the internal world to incorporate both positive and negative experiences and a more nuanced self-concept than the simplistic black and white image we started with. So, much to my surprise, the second movie manages to revisit the territory of the first in a new way, and it doesn't just play like a greatest hits version of last time. The integration of thoughts into a unified self-concept is a great way of visualizing the core ideas of cognitive therapy without seeming too artificial. And the new emotions are, surprise, surprise, not the bad guys, though their appearance throws everything into chaos, as development tends to do. I found myself thinking of a growing snake that sheds its skin to inhabit a larger self. And the movie shows how this can happen. I think that anyone who saw this film would have a kind of metaphorical language for self-understanding that they would find useful in a lot of situations, not least if they ever go for therapy. If someone was a real enthusiast of these films, I could easily mold much of our work around the concepts that the movies portray. I stayed late and I watched all the credits looking for the psychologist that I knew had to have consulted on Inside Out 2. Bravo to them and to the writers who managed to turn all these ideas into a workable story. Well done. If you haven't seen these movies, go see them. If you have, see them again. You were probably so caught up in the storytelling and the visuals that the psychological validity of a lot of the material probably slid past you. There is a lot there. I've seen a lot of movies influenced by psychology. I think these are among the best. I know what you're going to ask, especially if you cheated and watched this without having seen the movie. Yeah, but is it entertaining? Yes. But honestly, I don't care. You've been entertained by lots of stuff and then forgot all about it. You flushed those two hours of your life down the toilet. These films provide a perspective on life that you can take with you. They're worth seeing, even if for some reason, you aren't entertained. And if, 
unlike anyone in my theater, you suffer from what ennui calls zibodum. Listen, boredom is not lethal. I should know. I sat through Interstellar. You can sit through this. There are other videos on this channel on the psychology of everyday life. Click the subscribe button for more. I also have an online course site, psychologysalon.teachable.com, with programs for professionals and for the general public. And my books, The Assertiveness Workbook, How to Be Miserable, and How to Be Miserable in Your Twenties, are available from online booksellers. Thanks for watching.